Hi, my name is Bernard Featherman and I'm host of Business Today. We have a very interesting guest today. He's a businessman and he's running for representative also. And we find that in his business, it's really something for a lot of people who want to go in business to understand some of the difficulties and some of the wonders of success. I'd like to introduce Bill Quayle. Bill? How are you? How are you doing, Bernie? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, you're from this area originally. Where were you, in, in Saco and Biddeford? Or? That, yeah, I've been in the Biddeford Saco area pretty much all my life, uh, with a short exception of three years going to uh, Florida, where I worked as an electrician for a while. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I've been in this area all my life. Well, your father owned a service station at Five Points, am I correct? He did. He actually bought the um, Sunoco station at Five Points after the state took uh, a location uh, that he owned in Saco right. uh, for the spur renovation uh, of the turnpike years ago. Uh, so he bought that in 1977. Um, and I started actually working there in 1977, but I had previously worked at the Saco location as well. I started there when I was about uh, 12. <laughs> well, you have two brothers too that were involved. Yep, yep. Ken and Dave. Uh, they were actually my partners after we purchased the Sunoco station right. at Five Points in Biddeford. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, they were my partners for years and until of course the state took the Five Points location uh, to renovate Five Points. Well, that's interesting because I know that uh, you've continued on as a uh, car, expert car repair group and a service station in uh, Lower Village of Kennebunk. Tell us a little bit about that, how you got started. Well, um, it's probably common knowledge that <laughs> service stations and auto repairs aren't a very lucrative lifestyle. You, you can't make a lot of money doing it. So when we were at Five Points, we had, uh, of course, my father was there, my two brothers and I, and we decided that if we were ever going to make a salary, we'd better probably open up another location. So that's really how it started was um, we opened up Gabe Sunoco and Kenny Bunk, and we had, of course, Gabe Sunoco at Five Points, and we ran them concurrently for uh, four, maybe five years, um, again, until the Five Points location was, was taken over by the state. And what are your brothers doing now? Um, my brother Ken works for um, Mitsubishi, uh, and he works on power turbines, um, power stations. And my brother Dave is a nuclear inspector um, at the Portsmouth Navy Yard. So you really ended up as the businessman and uh, an entrepreneur, if I may say. Yeah, we. Uh, I, yeah, I didn't have any place else to go. They apparently did. So um, when um, when Five Points was taken, uh, uh, Dave decided that uh, he had previously worked at the yard, and they were going to give him some time back uh, that he hurt, that he originally had, uh, so he could retire there. Mm -hmm. uh, so he got his retirement years back from his previous employment there, and. Uh, Ken moved on uh, actually to another automotive facility uh, in Biddeford and uh, worked there for a short period of time uh, before going over to Mitsubishi. So yeah, I was pretty much the only one that stayed because um, I had the location in, in Lower Village that I was running and, um, and uh, so that's pretty much how it went. Well, how did you get into the trolley bus venture business that you're running also in uh, the yeah, Kenny Bunch. Yeah, that's, um, that's actually an interesting story. Um, I had just purchased, I had been leasing the Lower Village location for years, and then uh, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Russ Hildreth, uh, owned In Town Trolley Company. And he said to me, uh, I need to get out of this business. Well, I, I, talked, to, I talked him out of it for years. And then finally, uh, He'd had enough. He said, I got to get out of this. And uh, of course, like I said, I just finished purchasing the location that I was in. And it, and it was, uh, if you've ever purchased property, business property, commercial property, it can be, uh, it can be a long, long process. And I was, I was pretty burned out from buying it. And I, mm -hmm. I talked to my wife uh, about it. And Kathy said, well, um, why don't I run it? 
and uh, in a nutshell that's what happened and and she did all the work she visited all the banks she she took care of everything and uh, we were able to scrape enough pennies together to put a down payment on it and uh, and uh, well that's great uh, so she's been running that and she does a great job with that well I also noticed that you got into the motor scooter business <laughs> tell me about that the motor scooter business is a really interesting story because um, it was 2008 when we first started and uh, and if you remember 2008 was the year that fuel prices first rose up into that four dollar mark yes you remember that well when it when it happened uh, well, before it happened, I had talked to my family and I told the kids, we'd been talking about bringing scooters in for years mm -hmm. because a prior owner of the location uh, once sold um, Pook mopeds. He didn't sell a lot of them, but he had them there. And I thought, what an interesting idea. So we'd always joked, the staff and I, about bringing scooters back. So um, Kevin Roussel, who works for us now, uh, had been selling a few in Saco. Of course, gas prices were low, and he'd sold a few and was having a great time with it. Uh, then came to work for me, and I said, hey, Kevin, would you mind if we did it here? And he had the contacts, and I made a few phone calls and talked to my family, and, and they laughed at me. And I said, well, you know, I'll buy 18 of them, which is the minimum purchase at the time. I'll buy 18 of them. What I don't sell this year, I'll sell next year. Right. Uh, just as the order came in, gas prices started to soar. We sold those first 18 in the first week. Wow, that summer. <laughs> that summer we sold 200 scooters. And it only goes to prove that sometimes it's better to be lucky than to be good. Well, I don't know about that. Time. I think you really have to have the vision to where you want to go. Uh, I owned a moped uh, years ago. And uh, then when I sold the division, the mop head went with it. <laughs> you know, my wife didn't want me to go in on it anymore because I was getting a little older. But when you think about the savings of gas and the cost of getting around, it's a natural for a future type of sales. I think we're going to see more of this because the world is so changing rapidly that what we did yesterday with the iPod coming in changed everything again. Yeah. So you really have to have a vision of what you want to do. But it's interesting how you got into that. And uh, I have a friend of mine who uh, played tennis with a fella, and uh, he was told by the fella, you know, I own a cemetery. I'd really like to get rid of it. It's been in our family four generations. And the guy made a deal at the tennis club that he was at with this fellow on a napkin that he paid two dollars for to write the terms down. So I think, you know, everything is timing. And uh, sometimes we don't have that. But you were, if I remember correctly, in the Biddeford Saco Rotary, you were a president, am I right? Yeah, that's right. Of the right. Rotary. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was, um, oh, that was many years ago, back in, uh, 98, 99, right. um, we, had a, we had a great group. Uh, of course, we were meeting at the time at Mr. Keeley's restaurant, the Wonder Bar. Right, Vince. Uh, right. Yeah. And, uh, and we were having a, a really nice time that year. We, uh, we did a lot of changes in the community. We helped a lot of people. Uh, we sold a lot of oranges and a lot of french fries. And, uh, and uh, we had about 100 members um, that year that was uh, a little bit of a decrease in membership. Um, so we kind of joke about that, saying right. uh, during my year we brought the club down to a manageable level. Uh, but it, but it, was a, it was a great time. It was a great year. It was a great experience. And uh, again, it, it's great for the Bitterford community. Um, that Rotary Club does, does so much. Um, does they so do. much They're good. Very uh, outstanding group of men and women. Um, as I headed up the Chamber of Commerce as president for four years, and I know I attended many Rotary meetings. In fact, my wife got a plaque from uh, the Rotary one year. It was uh, one of the awards you give out. Yeah, the Paul Harris Fellow, right, I believe. Paul Harold right. uh, uh, Fellow. And um, 
the quality of the business people there were so wonderful. In fact, the chamber itself has so many good small business people as well that we need that as a foundation for our own community here. And there should be a collaboration between communities to make sure that we do have more small businesses set up in the future because we'll need that. People will want to go into their own business eventually, whether it's micro businesses of a small amount in the neighborhood or one in the community itself. But you did get to meet a lot of people, I assume, in the Rotary and oh, that sure did. really was a great, great group of people. Well, what do you think about business in the future? Well, I think if we get past some challenges, I think we'll be great. The, one of the great things about America is we can all own a small business. And in Maine, 90%, 97 percent of all businesses, right, are owned as small businesses. They're small businesses. Right. Small businesses employ 55 some odd percent of the private sector workforce. So, so you're right. Small business is huge, and it's and it is the foundation for communities. Um, Baylor and LSU did a study recently um, that showed that small businesses in a vibrant small business community were healthier, happier communities. And that's really what it's all about. If you can, if you can build small businesses and support small businesses and help reduce restrictions on small businesses and allow them to thrive and allow them to employ and allow them to have the freedom to provide health insurance for their, for their employees by reducing restrictions on health insurance costs which are crippling small businesses. I think, I think you're right. That's the key to our communities. Small businesses, uh, I can't say enough about how small businesses care for the communities. Um, I have people knocking on the door every day. My wife and I have, uh, have taken a lot of pride in the fact that we've been very involved in, um, in helping causes, community causes, um, either monetarily or, or by physically helping. Well, you were, if I remember correctly, you were with the, uh, uh, the North, um, I'm trying to think of it now. It was YMCA. YMCA, yes. Yeah, I was on the board of the directors uh, of the YMCA for, uh, gosh, many years. What and a great organization, too. And they, they really do wonders, not only for families, but for people in their own community. Yeah, and one of the one of the things that that we worked on while while I was there, um, we had come out of some very very tough financial times uh, at the Y, and um, together with the board of directors, uh, we implemented, uh, which is still ongoing now, is we don't refuse anyone due to their lack of ability to pay. We make sure that we can scholarship. Um, everyone that walks through the door, everyone that wants to better their lives, everyone that wants child care. And that, again, is, as far as I know, still in place today. Well, and they have a, a wonderful woman who is executive director that used to run the 26-mile run. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to talk quite often. And it's amazing how people not only keep in shape, work for other people to keep in shape too. That's right. Because they have a swimming pool there and a gymnasium and so many different social events to do things, including uh, parents that have young children and they have like a little camp for them as right. well, if I can Summer recall. Camp, that's right. Very and uh, it's funny, as you, you look at the community itself, small business like yourself is so important because that's the backbone of our community. And I think that uh, it's just marvelous to hear a businessman who's successful at it. Sometimes, you know, you face a problem and you don't know quite what to do. What's the one biggest problem you faced in what you do? The uh, keeping, keeping expenses under control. That is a problem. It is, and, and it's, it, the, the thing is, is that, as, as we just talked about earlier, health insurance costs have really gone up. Yes. Um, health insurance costs 
um, between Insurances have raised their rates. I know my son is paying 8% more for insurance this year, and last year it went up about 6 or 7%. Right. And uh, I just don't know uh, how these young folks will be able to continue on. Well, they can't, and, and that's the thing. And, and if you can't, as an employer, provide health insurance, co health insurance to your employees, mm -hmm. um, I, I feel that you're really not doing your job. And, and, and a lot of people are touting the Obamacare plan, and, and, but I'm not sure that's the way we want to go. Well, it's another tax. It's another tax. And, 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 and that's, we're getting hit on all sides. We are. Uh, and it's difficult for small businesses to employ more people now because they're concerned about regulations. They're concerned about the economy. Uh, I think that uh, the elections will have something to do with it. Uh, we don't know how it's going to turn out and what we're going to do. But small business gives an opportunity for people to do and command their own directions. Exactly. And they're their own bosses, even if they don't make any money that they could when they go out, an electrician would go out and if you know, and can make 60, 70, $90,000 a year. And a small businessman may just make enough to, to keep his cost of living at home. That's right. But it's his own. It's his own. And, and that's the difference. And there's, there's a certain pride in ownership. There's, yes. a, um, there's a certain responsibility that comes with it too. Um, well, small businesses hire more people. The average small business today, I say, runs up to 10, 12 people, even though it's considered small business when you hire up to 100 or 200 people. 500. Well, 500 is a standard with government. Yeah. But I'm saying the small businesses that we have in our own community normally have between 10 to 15 people. Yes, exactly. And uh, it's so important that we employ our own people with jobs. And small business is the economic engine that does it. And it's hard to say it because people out there don't realize that it's difficult to make a living, first of all, and it's difficult for small businesses to make a living. It really Not is. easy. It really is. And one of the things that, um, that we talked about with, with health insurance costs, and, I, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to go back to that for a minute. Sure. Is that we were talking about health insurance costs, and we talked about the health insurance program being a tax. And, it, and it's true, but one of the things that I've noticed that, that hardly anybody, politicians or anyone, seem to be talking about is, is that there are some core problems that have been cited as the reason for the increase in health insurance costs. Uh, the first being um, between 1997 and 2000, health care costs tripled, health insurance costs tripled mm -hmm. in the United States. During that time, um, prescription drug costs, expenses on, on drugs, prescription drugs, went up $180 billion a year nationwide, due in part to the fact that drug companies were advertising on television and magazines. So people were seeing that, going to their doctor and saying, hey, this is the drug for me. Hey. Doc, can you prescribe this for me? The other thing that, um, that's been cited as a problem with our health insurance, our, our health community our, at large, is the ability for patients to go on the internet and learn more about their disease than their doctors know. At least that's what patients you know, are thinking. That's true because uh, if there's anything wrong in our family uh, where we have a cold or a sore arm or something, my wife goes to the internet and looks it up. Right, to see what's going on. And finds out what the causes are and how to solve it. Right. And, but the problem with that is many patients are actually going to their doctors and telling them what procedures they need. Um, well, I think we need to do this. I did some research. I think I have this. Well, tests and procedures um, are really ratcheting up health insurance costs. Well, and they're the doing it, however, they're doing it for this reason, Bill, because there's a tremendous amount of suits going on uh, by lawyers. And I 
I have a son who's a lawyer, and I can see where doctors are afraid they'll be sued for something that goes wrong, so they order extra MRIs and extra types of lab uh, disclosures and x-rays that may be a little overbearing, but it protects them from suits. Protects them from suits, and another thing, doctors are typically paid for procedures. So procedures equal dollars. So the incentive is, okay, if some uh, patient walks in and says, I think I need this, well, they don't want to be sued. Plus, if they do the procedure, they, they can make a little extra money. That's there was a, true. There was I a agree long, with you. There was a long study done by a, a gentleman at Dartmouth who cited that one-third of all procedures done in the United States either has no effect or does harm to a patient. I think I read something like that. You're right. And it's to the tune of, I want to say it's, it's $800 billion nationwide. So some of those problems with, with medicine in general can be resolved at the core level when doctors are taking control of their practices again. And, and, and there's a movement, actually, where doctors are doing that. And, and that's great, and that will help lower costs right, right out of the gate. Well, we're very fortunate to have in our own community an excellent hospital. Yes, uh, we do. Southern Maine Med, which is associated now with Maine Med. Mm -hmm. um, there will, however, be a shortage of doctors in the future mm -hmm. because we have people going in and out of the trade that are now, instead of being independent offices, they're now going into a situation, Bill, where they're working with a group. Exactly. And uh, then they Employees don't have the, the insurance they don't have to worry about. Correct. Uh, they, uh, but it will end up almost like lawyers where they're going to have their time so much of a cost. If they put in 15 minutes with a patient, they're going to charge them X amount of dollars. Right. They aren't going to have the time to talk to a patient like they did before. And they're and, talking about with the new system that's yes, being proposed. Right. Yeah. And this is things that people are concerned about. Look, we have poor people in this world that have to be taken care of, and I think it's a responsibility. I do too. But I, I heard a story the other day that said, well, if someone doesn't work for a living and just gets food stamps and subsidies, they're going to constantly do the same thing over and over again rather than just working uh, to get that extra grant from the government. So we do have to have jobs for people to work at. It's very important. Jobs are extremely important. Yes. And that is the most important thing in my mind because the economy today, Bill, and you feel it in your service station areas, you feel it in your mop head sales, you even feel it in people that want to go on a tour with their bus, that they're tightening their belt because the monies aren't there now. Mm -hmm. The amount of income that they get from monies they have put away in banks, instead of getting five to six percent interest a year, they're getting four to one percent interest a year on CDs. So they're seeing less money and they have to cut their standards of living down. Absolutely. And this is happening with all businesses. And in all walks of life, yes. by the way. And uh, it's difficult because we're facing this on an ongoing basis. And I've heard experts say that we're in for anywhere from five to seven years before housing gets back on its feet. We're looking at maybe eight to 10 years before our economy is back in shape. And it's all discouraging news. But I still say it's the best thing in the world to have your own business. If you can start a business, even a micro business in your neighborhood, that you put a couple of thousand dollars on sewing, or you do errands, running uh, various things, cleaning uh, establishments uh, and homes, where you can do things and earn a living, 
to help you make ends meet. And then those who were really looking ahead, because who knew about iPod two years ago? It's changed everything. We don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now or even five years from now. Correct. There'll be geniuses out there that'll invent new things and change our mode of living again. That's right. And I've heard that even a car they're working on in the automotive field that will drive itself. What you have to do is put in where you got to go. And I mean, these are mind boggling. And who would believe that years ago, I remember this, there was a, a Superman had a watch and it had uh, various things on the watch where you could talk to people. And um, in the end, now we have cell phones. We have all sorts of things right. that came out 20 to 30, 50 years later. So things are changing radically. But basically, in your business, do you see a growth coming up again in the next three to five years? And what do you intend to do? The, well, we've started um, already cutting costs. Right. That was one of the first things that, that really had to go. And because there are two ways to, to have more money. One is to cut expenses, and the other is to charge more. And both work. <laughs> and both work. Well, you have certain expenses that are right. fixed, and you can't really do anything with that. But you just alluded to the fact that people don't have any more money. Right. There's not any more out there. So how are we going to justify increasing prices? It's a slippery slope. You can't, you can't really do that. So what we've elected to do was, until the economy turns around, is just basically to cut non-essential, or what we feel are non-essential uh, expenditures. Uh, one of the things that we chose to cut, it's a difficult decision because you don't want to cut your advertising. Um, but again, you alluded to the fact that we have electronics today. So a lot of people are reaching us through uh, the website. Right. And my wife, Catherine, was very smart. And I sometimes... All women are pretty smart, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> and sometimes I can't see the forest for the trees. And she said, why are you advertising so heavily in the yellow pages? I said, because well, I always have. Yeah. And she said, you're in a small community. People aren't going to come from 50 miles away to come see you. So why don't you reduce your exposure in the yellow pages and save yourself some money there? And... Uh, well, of course she was right, and, and, and we ended up doing that. And one of the things we did was cut our radio advertising a little bit. But I didn't want to do that because that was also supporting another small business in town, right. our local radio station. So, so that some of the decisions are very tough decisions to make. Um, I've kept my guys employed, and for the first time last winter, um, I explained to them that if there's no work coming in, someone may have to go home. I, you know, again, these guys need their, their, their money. It's a difficult decision. It's I an incredibly agree. difficult decision. But in order to keep the business afloat, these are some of the decisions that we had to make. Um, I have confidence that, that this whole thing is going to turn around. Um, we... we experienced some some tax cuts in Maine recently. Mm -hmm. uh, Maine is now uh, regarded as a as a more business friendly state as of the last couple of years. That is really good news. We have a long way to go. But but if we can get new jobs into the state, if we can educate our people, uh, our young people, get them to schools, train them for the jobs that are available. You had a really nice article, by the way, oh. in the uh, Journal Tribune the other day um, that I read, and I thought it was very nicely put. And, and we really do need to, <coughs> we really need to get our, our children to colleges. We need to get them to uh, trade schools. Community colleges are doing a great job. But what we need to do is be able to market to companies outside of the state and have the ability for the schools to participate in an incoming company's success. That's right. So, Unfortunately, Bill, if I can just tell you, go ahead. People, 
people get an education and go away to school and college, 60% of those young men and women don't return back to Biddeford, Saco, or Kennebunk. We know that, yeah. Yes, and this is very disconcerting because we have to have businesses here for them to come back to. And it's going to be tougher. The kids that have the college education today will end up with a lot of jobs that are low entry mm -hmm. because there is nothing else. Yeah, you're 100% right. right. They and have to have more of the STEM, that is the mathematics, the sciences, technologies, exactly. and engineering skills. And if people have even plumbing, if they graduate high school, plumbing, electronics, or electricity, they have carpentry, they can make a good living. That's correct. And I don't understand why we don't have better vocational training for these young men and women to do that because there are jobs out there, they just have to be trained for it. And it may be that it takes a year or two years to get approval going through it if there's a union. And that's difficult because they don't make that much money during that time. But it's well worth the game to stay in that and specialize in things that they can make a living at. So not only will people make a living, but you'll grow and you'll employ more people that are mechanics that are needed so urgently that don't have the skills. And you'll have people that are in sales to sell your mop eds. And you'll have people that will be driving who are retired driving your buses. So they have something to do. Absolutely. And that's really what we have to look forward to. Well, with all this stuff we've talked about, is there anything else you'd like to add before we end? Because we, uh, we want people out there to send in comments and contact you as well as us on their concerns. And I feel that it's so important that we let our community people know what's going on, not only in business, but in their own community so they can adjust accordingly for the future. There's nothing like a Mainer, I'll tell you something. I've been here only 16 years and I wish I was here as a Mainer all my life. They're an exceptional group of people. And you are too, I want you to know that, Bill. Thank you, Brian. And it's delightful talking to you. And uh, I certainly wish you well in the future. And I want to say thank you for coming in. Thank you for and having talking me, to people there. I sure do appreciate Before it. Before we leave, give them your phone number one time so that if they do have car problems, they need repaired. Where can we reach you? You can reach me at Gabe Sunoco at 207-967-9700 in Lower Village, County Bunk. Or if you want a scooter, that. same number, 967-9700. Thanks. Hey, that was twice. And one more time, they say the third time, you'll third understand Third time's a charm? Yes, yes. 967-9700. Okay. Thank you very Folks, much. Folks, thank you very much for listening to us today. We hope it's been uh, enlightening for you. Please contact us again. My name is Bernard Featherman, and the show is Business Today. Goodbye. <laughs>